With his shocking stage persona and controversial songs, Marilyn Manson became a sensation in the 90s, but his fall from grace was fast. From claims that he physically abused his partners to allegations of sexual assault, Manson's downfall was years in the making. Before there was Marilyn Manson, there was Brian Warner. His pseudonym is a combination of the first name of glamorous sex symbol Marilyn Monroe and the last name of infamous cult leader Charles Manson. Marilyn Monroe and Charles Manson to me were the most memorable people from the 60s for their own separate reasons. Warner's image of Marilyn Manson seemed to arrive fully formed, but without the music. He went to college for journalism, and the very first article he ever wrote was about a made-up rock star called Marilyn Manson. Warner intended for Marilyn Manson to be his stage name, but he hadn't written any songs yet. Manson's earliest shows were performed under the name Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids. The first recording of Warner performing features him accompanied by acoustic guitars and a tambourine. During that performance, the young Warner described himself as bashful in front of crowds, and at one point, he recited a poem for this small audience. The band seemed to come up with songs to cover in the moment and played them until Warner forgot the words. Marilyn Manson's first studio album was Portrait of an American Family, released by Trent Reznor's label, Nothing. It was largely overlooked upon its 1994 release. After Manson's rise to fame, however, the album received widespread attention and critical acclaim. The following year, Manson released an EP of covers and remixes called Smells Like Children. That record included a cover of the 80s new wave song Sweet Dreams Are Made of This by the Eurythmics. The cover was a hit within the industrial music scene and set the stage for the huge mainstream success of Manson's third album, Antichrist Superstar, which Manson has claimed was inspired by several apocalyptic dreams that he came to believe were prophetic visions. Marilyn Manson's music depicts a specific kind of anger and alienation that is cathartic for many of his listeners. His act was intentionally subversive and irreverent, and vitally important to adolescents who felt like outcasts. Occasionally, this caused a kind of moral panic. As described by Salon, religious leaders, concerned parents, and school districts feared that listening to Manson's lyrics put children at risk. Some attempted to draw links between the violent imagery in Manson's lyrics and real acts of violence by possible fans. But according to sociologist Donna Gaines, author of Teenage Wasteland, Suburbia's Dead End Kids, some alienated teenagers may have felt less isolated by listening to Manson's music. So, as Gaines argues in her book, Manson's music probably saved the lives of more teenagers than any parent would like to admit. In the immediate aftermath of the 1999 mass shooting at Columbine High School, the public was desperate for answers. The media speculated wildly, and as described by Kerrang!, the most popular narrative was that the two shooters were Marilyn Manson fans who had decided to commit murder because of his music. In a 2017 interview with The Guardian, Marilyn Manson stated that the Columbine mass shooting destroyed his career. Did you endorse mass shootings? No, absolutely not. In 2002, Manson was interviewed for Michael Moore's Bowling for Columbine, a documentary about the tragedy. He was asked what he would say to the kids at Columbine and was praised for his response. I wouldn't say a single word to them. I would listen to what they have to say, and that's what no one did. This exemplified the kind of understanding for troubled youth that had attracted many Manson fans to begin with. However, many of his less quoted replies make it sound like Manson was jealous of the killers. According to Billboard magazine, in one interview, Manson seemed to resent the fact that the shooters were on the cover of Time magazine while he never had been. As noted by Rolling Stone, Manson complained in another interview, I got blamed for Columbine and I had absolutely nothing to do with it. At least the killers had their kicks before the whole house went down in flames. So now I think that I've been blamed for about 36 school shootings. Part of Marilyn Manson's appeal was his rejection of mainstream values, cultural beliefs, and American ideologies. In his autobiography, Manson described himself as an alarm clock waking the world up from unexamined beliefs instilled by Christianity and the media. While Manson's sound was not particularly revolutionary or challenging, the content of his work was always exploring taboos. As detailed in an article by researcher and writer Coco Dunt, much of Manson's early work explicitly questions institutions such as the nuclear family, tying them to extremist points of view and violence. And although Manson's work was theoretically a rejection of mainstream ideas, it's also tied to pop culture and celebrity. However, Manson himself never avoided being a part of mainstream culture, as he appeared on late-night talk shows and ultimately became a commercial success. Rather than pushing fame away, 
Manson seemed to crave celebrity. While Marilyn Manson's career was flourishing, he was spiraling. In his autobiography, Manson described how his behavior had begun to push away his creative collaborators, costing him opportunities and stalling the production of his album. To cope, he engaged in self-harm and risky drug use. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Manson said there had even been a rumor that he was going to die by suicide on Halloween. The singer also revealed that he began feeling like he would have to go through with it. However, a bomb threat at his Halloween concert prevented the situation from happening. Throughout his career, the majority of Manson's public exploits and statements to the media were dismissed as rock star behavior or an extension of his extreme antisocial persona. While Columbine played a part in destroying Marilyn Manson's career, his attempt to challenge mainstream culture while also positioning himself firmly inside it may have ultimately done more damage. In 2017, MTV reported on an apparent celebrity beef between Manson and pop star Justin Bieber. According to Manson, Bieber was telling people he was making the shock rocker relevant again by selling his old merch. Whether or not the Bieber t-shirt drama was real, it was emblematic of a larger issue in Manson's career. He wasn't really shocking anymore. An article by Westward in 2018 described Manson as no longer scary and theorized it was because American society had caught up with him. The news was more shocking than his act. Manson continued to release albums full of violent imagery, but over time, the majority of his media coverage shifted to reports on his romantic relationships, awkward TV appearances, and in 2017, an injury. As described by The Guardian, Manson accidentally pulled a large stage prop onto himself during a show, causing him to be carried off stage in a stretcher. Later, he would have to perform several live shows in a wheelchair. Some fans also complained that the quality of Marilyn Manson's concerts was going down. Furthermore, in 2018, Westward said that his singing wasn't particularly strong and described him as a little sad. In 2018, actor Evan Rachel Wood participated in a House Judiciary Subcommittee, where she shared her experience with physical, psychological, and sexual domestic abuse. Several years later, she publicly confirmed that she was talking about her former partner, Marilyn Manson. In her testimony, Wood said that during their relationship, she suffered all types of abuse. The actor stated in her testimony, My experience with domestic violence was this, toxic mental, physical, and sexual abuse, which started slow but escalated over time, including threats against my life, severe gaslighting, and brainwashing. I thought I was the only human who experienced this, and I carried so much guilt and confusion about my response to the abuse. Wood described how she feared trying to escape Manson, believing that he would kill her. As a result of the abuse, she experienced depression, agoraphobia, night terrors, and addiction, and developed post-traumatic stress syndrome. Manson denied Wood's allegations and said he was being targeted because of his controversial work. In an Instagram post, he stated, Obviously, my art and life have long been magnets for controversy, but these recent claims about me are horrible distortions of reality. Since Evan Rachel Wood's testimony, more than a dozen women have come forward with their own stories of Marilyn Manson's abuse. The accusations include accounts of Manson subjecting his partners to violent physical abuse, including cutting them with knives, electrocuting them, and even chasing one of his partners with an ax. As described in an expose from Rolling Stone, there have been many similar stories of extreme psychological abuse. The most bizarre of these involves a soundproof recording booth made of glass. According to the Rolling Stone piece, Manson allegedly turned the booth into a cell that he forced his partners into for hours at a time. The booth was used by the singer as a form of punishment, where he kept food from his victims and prevented them from sleeping. The cell was even described by Manson in a 2011 interview, in which he referred to it as the bad girl's room. Several of Manson's accusers, including model Ashley Morgan Smithline and actor Esme Bianco filed lawsuits against him, with charges including human trafficking and unlawful imprisonment. Legally, it's unclear what consequences Marilyn Manson might face. Several lawsuits were filed against the singer, though two have been dismissed due to the two-year statute of limitations. In November 2021, Special Victims Unit investigators raided Manson's Los Angeles home. However, a source with the LA County Sheriff could not provide Rolling Stone with details on what was found during the search of Manson's belongings. After the very public defamation trial between Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, Manson is attempting to sue Evan Rachel Wood for defamation. 
Insider has also reported that some social media accounts dedicated to defending Depp have started posting content about Manson. While some fans appear to be backing Manson, however, journalist David Futrell reported that the majority of Manson's online fans seem to believe Wood. Manson's career has experienced a rapid fallout from the accusations. In February 2021, the singer was dropped by his label, Loma Vista Recordings. The following day, Manson's agents at CAA also dropped him. Furthermore, Manson's scenes were cut out of a third season episode of American Gods, and the streaming service Shudder decided not to air an episode of Creepshow in which he appeared. In the wake of the numerous accusations against Marilyn Manson, the singer's longtime fans have had to reconcile their feelings about him. Many of Manson's earlier statements have been reevaluated since the accusations, and stories that were initially dismissed as typical rock star bravado have been reassessed as a part of a pattern of cruelty and violence. Numerous women heard my story and they knew exactly who it was. I realized that I wasn't the only one that this had happened to. As described in Rolling Stone, Manson's early stage act included hitting a woman in a cage. In his autobiography, Manson joked that he might have caused the woman brain damage and briefly considered killing her. In an interview in 1995, he stated that he was attracted to women who were terrified of him. After Evan Rachel Wood split up with him the first time, Manson told Spin that he had attempted to get her back by calling her 158 times in a row while self-harming. Manson's intention was to make Wood feel guilty. The singer's accusers also believe that he was able to use his controversial persona to hide in plain sight. Marilyn Manson's anger had been seen as a rebellion against an oppressive and hypocritical society, but in hindsight, he never hid who he really was. If you or anyone you know is struggling with unhealthy drug use or experiencing suicidal thoughts, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website. Contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357 or call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by dialing 988 or by calling 1-800-273-TALK-8255.